You're among our visitors today. We are glad you're here. Believe me, we are. We appreciate so much when people take time out of their busy lives to come and join with us as we worship God here at this place. So thank you for coming, and we certainly hope that you feel at home. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask us, well, please feel free to do that. We'll do our very best to give you a Bible answer to any Bible question that you might have. You know, hearing is a sense that we have that I think sometimes we take for granted until we begin to have problems uh, with our hearing. And I know, uh, speaking from experience, that's, that's the case with me. Uh, having a couple of years ago been able to be fitted with what my granddaughter Jenna calls earplugs, uh, uh, I, I, I tend to uh, really uh, appreciate hearing uh, more than perhaps I did when I was younger and not taking good care of uh, the ears and the ear drums. Uh, you know, when you get these things that I got that help you to hear, I, I sometimes feel like the guy that uh, these two old men down at the, the mall were sitting there talking and one was telling the other about getting some new hearing aids. He said, Ralph, i got to tell you, so these are the best hearing aids that money can buy. I said, I, I, I can't even begin to tell you what I had to pay for them, but man, I'm hearing things now that, well, I've never heard before. So he's going on and on about that. And finally, Ralph asked him, well, that's great. He said, man, what kind are they? He said, 230. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe he wasn't hearing as, as well. He's not as bad as uh, the lady that I was reading about uh, recently. She and her husband were traveling from Tennessee to Little Rock, Arkansas, and over in Arkansas, they got pulled over by a state trooper. The state trooper goes up to the car, and uh, he asked the man who was driving, he said, do you know how fast you were driving? And the man's wife said, what did he say? And he said, well, he wouldn't know if I knew if I was speeding. And he looked at the license, and he said, well, I see you're not from around here. And he said, no, we're from Memphis. And his wife said, what did you say? He said, well, I told him we're from Memphis. And finally the policeman said as he was writing out a ticket, he said, you know, I believe the meanest woman I ever met was from Memphis. Wife said, what did he say? And he said he thinks he knows you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we have some problems with hearing, I, no doubt about that. Uh, but but uh, you know, in the text, and I thank Connor for reading that in, 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 uh, in the eighth chapter of the book of Luke, in that text, we, we read about Jesus cautioning us about hearing. He really is talking about a hearing problem. Uh, not necessarily like I have described there, but in giving what is referred to by some, and it's what I call it as the, it's just a short parable, the parable of the lamp. You don't light a candle, you don't light a lamp, and then cover it over. And so in the, and by the way, let me tell you, this parable was told right on the heels of the parable of the soul. And you know, I think this is one of the most familiar parables that we can read about in the scriptures, the parable of the soul. Jesus tells about a man who goes out and he sows seed. That is, he just scatters some seed, uh, you know, as he's going. And uh, uh, yeah, it's a great, great story. And in the scattering of the seed, Jesus tells about four types of soil, or the application is four kinds of hearers of the word. He said there's some hearers like hardened ground. It just, you know, it just bounces off. Don't pay attention to it. And he said there's some hearers, you know, like stony ground. That is, not just rocky soil, but soil that uh, well, just maybe has a little bit over a big slab of rock and, you know, the seed goes down, springs up, and it's good for a while, but there's no root. And so it just withers away. And then the third type of soil is one that's all involved in the cares of this world. Our mind is so filled with the deceitfulness of riches and the pursuit of pleasure, we have no interest in the Word. Oh, we might receive it for a while, but you know what? It just is choked out by other pursuits and other interests. Then Jesus talks about some good soil. He tells about some soil that is receptive to the Word. It receives that Word. It loves that word, it's good and, 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 and cultivated soil, and that word springs up because it's taken root, and it bears fruit. Now that's the parable of the sower. Now immediately after that, Jesus tells this very short parable of the lamb. And in this parable, Jesus cautions us that we need to be careful how we hear, not just to receive, not just to hear that word, but as he said in Luke 8 and verse 8, uh, in, in verse 8, that we are to you know, take heed how we hear, that is, 
He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Listen, you need to receive that word. You need to hear that word. You need to accept that word. You need to, to bring it in. And, and let it become part of you. Don't cover it. Don't bury it. Don't shroud it over. But be open and receptive to the truth. Receive it. Live it. And spread it to others. And then notice how he concludes the parable. He says, therefore take heed how you hear. You know, did you ever stop and think about that? That, that? That's just a very profound observation. Be careful. You know, there are certain ways that you can hear that are not productive. So he said, take heed how you hear. And then he says this that is equally provocative. Whoever has. Now what he's talking about here is receptacles to receive that word. That's what he's talking about here. He's not talking about talents or abilities. He uses that in another illustration in another place. But in this instance, Jesus is talking about receptacles to receive that word. You, take it, you, you be careful how you hear the word. And then he says, because whoever has, to him more will be given. Whoever has more hearing receptacles will receive more receptacles. And whoever does not have even what he seems to have will be taken away from him. You know, Jesus, when he says, take heed or be careful how you hear, this is something that Jesus often warned us about. You think, how many times he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, something very similar to that is said to all of the seven churches of Asia in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. But several times in the Gospels, Matthew 11, 15, Luke 14, 35, Luke 8, and verse 8, and many others, Jesus said, hey, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That is, you better be receptive to what the Bible teaches. You better be receptive to the Word of God. You take heed how you hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said this on one occasion in Matthew 16 and verse 6, and he's talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees. He says, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Be careful. And he says this in Matthew 24 and verse 4, take heed that no one deceives you. You need to be careful how you hear because there are those who are deceivers about. Now, if you don't have receptacles to hear the Word of God, then you're not going to receive. If you're not willing to have an honest and an open and a good heart, you're not going to receive that Word. You be careful. And, you know, as a matter of fact, this reminds us that the Bible was written to reveal, not conceal. A lot of people seem to have the idea that the Bible is a concealed book. And without having a direct illumination of the Holy Spirit, you're never going to be able to understand it. That's a false conclusion. The Bible has been written in a way that we can understand it. Remember the passage we often refer to in Ephesians 3, verses 3 and 4. Paul says, when you read it, you may understand my knowledge into the mystery of Christ. So it's read readable, that is, it's legible, and it is understandable. This is the reason why Jesus was so incredulous with Nicodemus who didn't understand about the new birth. In, in John chapter 3 and verse 10, Jesus said, are you a teacher in Israel and do not know these things? You don't understand? What in the world is wrong with you? Well, what, what's the, you're, you're, you're putting yourself off as a teacher and you don't even understand these things? But I'm going to tell you something. Nicodemus was no anomaly. That is, he's no exception here. Misunderstanding is something that's pretty widespread when it comes to the revealed will of God. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. In the Old Testament, book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 10, here's what God says to Isaiah when Isaiah is commissioned to preach to the people. God said, I want you to go speak to them. Make the heart of the people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Now what God is saying here is that I want you, Isaiah, to go speak to the people. But you know what? The people are not going to listen to you. They're not going to hear what you've got to say. In actuality, what these people are going to do is become dull of hearing. They're just going to shut their ears and they're going to close their eyes. As a matter of fact, their hearts will just be hard. But now, here's the problem with that. 
As you read on through the book of Isaiah, you learn that these people misunderstood that clear statement. Over in the 63rd chapter, in verse 17, here's how they concluded. They rebelled against what Isaiah said, but they blamed it on God. They said, Oh Lord, why have you made us stray from your ways and hardened our heart from your fear? God, it's your fault. You see, they misunderstood. It wasn't that it was so shrouded with mystery that they had to misunderstand it. No, they just misunderstood. When you go into the New Testament, you find the same thing occur. Jesus said to them, this is right after He cleared the, cleansed the temple of the money changers and people were all upset about that. Jesus answered, said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now do you think they understood that? No. They misunderstood then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body, John 2, verses 20 and 21. But you get over in Matthew 26 and verse 61, you find out they're still misunderstanding that. So the Bible is written in such a way that it's understandable, it's legible, and God expects us to understand it. However, there are those who misunderstand it. And by the way, I believe that misunderstanding exists today. Let me give you a for instance here. Which of these sayings would be in the Bible? I'm just going to put up some sayings here and we'll go over these and you tell me which of these are in the Bible. Moderation in all things. The Lord works in mysterious ways. The eye is the window of the soul. The lion will lay down with the lamb. A fool and his money are soon parted. This too shall pass. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Once saved, always saved. God helps those who help themselves. Now these are common sayings. And there are, every one of these sayings is attributed to the Bible. Now which one or how many of those sayings are actually found in the Bible? you may be surprised to learn not a one of them are found in the Scriptures. Not a one of them are there. And yet this just shows to us how very easy it is not to be careful how you hear what the Bible is teaching or how you hear what God has to say. And so there's obviously, even though the Bible is written in a way that you can understand it, it's obvious people don't. Now the problem of misunderstanding lies with us, not with God. That's the problem. The problem lies in the hearts of those who are receiving that word or who are listening to that word. That's where the problem lies. It lies not with God. That's why Jesus said, no one, when his little lamp covers it with a vessel, you know, that, that lamp here is the Word of God, that which illuminates our way. Well, you don't, you don't shroud that. You don't cover it. Well, rather, he says, you take heed how you hear. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and whoever does not have, even what he seems to have, will be taken away. And yet, there are people who say, yeah, I don't understand. I don't understand the Bible. Really, J.R., I read it. And, and I try to study it. And, and man, I, I just come away. I, I, I'm, I'm just lost. And I don't understand it. And, and that's just a common problem. But the question that I want to ask is, if the Bible is written in a way that you can understand it, if God has revealed His will in a legible, understandable way, now there's some things that are more difficult to understand than others. But if the Bible is written in a way that it can be understood, the question is, why? Why is it I don't understand the Bible? Because you see, I believe there are reasons for this. And I believe the reasons are not nearly as complicated as sometimes we want to make them be. So why is it that people don't understand that which is written in a way to be understood? I'm going to present to you what I consider to be four solid reasons why people do not understand the Bible as it is written. 
I think reason number one is there are people who refuse to accept the Bible as the sole standard of authority. It is just not enough. Or I don't consider it to be that divine revealed will of God that is intended to direct my life. I think there are too many people today who refuse to receive the Bible as the Thessalonians received it, 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. You see, if we don't accept the Bible as the inspired word of God that has final say in our lives, we're not going to understand it. You know, one of the things we need to realize is in Hebrews chapter 8, when the Bible talks about how that we need to build all things according to the pattern. That's just not talking about you know, things that pertain to the church, the worship and the work of the church. It's talking about our entire existence is to be built upon the premise that the Bible is the Word of God and it directs my life. It is that which controls my life. Now, if I'm not willing to accept that, then the Bible is just going to be a hodgepodge of writings of men and I'm not going to be concerned with understanding it. And in reality, I'm going to come away with a great misunderstanding of the Bible. You see, in the parable of the sower in Luke 8 and verse 11, the seed is the Word of God. This is what the Bible is. It is the Word of Almighty God. And being the Word of Almighty God, it is to be the standard by which we build our lives upon. And in order to understand that, we've got to want to receive it. John 7 and verse 17 reminds us that we must be willing to do before we understand. I must be willing to accept the Bible as the sole standard of authority from God. And when I do, then I'll understand it. That's the good ground, Matthew 13 and verse 22. And if you receive the word on the good ground, Matthew 13 and verse 20, reminds us that we will understand it. Matthew 13, 23. You receive it on the good ground, you will understand it. When you and I are willing to accept the Bible as the bottom line in matters of faith, matters of life, we'll understand it. It's it, it, it just as, uh, as simple as that. You know, we know passages such as eh, Romans 10 and verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You ever stop thinking? Faith comes by hearing hearing by... Faith doesn't come by hearing commentaries. Faith doesn't come by hearing what man has to say. Faith comes solely by hearing the Word of God. It doesn't come by anything else. You know what's interesting to me? This parable of the lamp that we talked about in Luke 8, if you read Mark's account of that, Mark has, a, has an account of that in his gospel, the same parable, but interestingly enough, Mark records something additional that Jesus said. Mark says that Jesus said in Mark 4 and verse 24, take heed what you hear. You see, it's not just essential that we take heed how we hear, you got to be careful what you hear. you got to be careful who you listen to. you got to be careful who you, careful who you study with. you got to be careful about what it is that you're reading. you got to be careful what religious teachers you pay any attention to because Jesus pointed out in Matthew 15 and verse 14 that the blind guides, regardless of their sincerity, will guide the blind and both will wind up in the ditch regardless of how it's you know, loving and kind it seems that they are. So you need to be careful what you listen to and how you hear and you need to accept the Bible as the sole standard of authority. That if it God, it's what God says and this is what I'm going to accept. Develop your faith based upon the Bible, not upon your parents, not upon the preacher, not upon the local church you happen to be a part of, not upon somebody that you have a great deal of admiration for. Not upon family, not upon family traditions. You build your faith upon the Word of God. You see, if your attitude is the same attitude that Balaam had in Numbers 22 and verse 18 when he said, oh, you know, though Barak give me his house full of silver, his gold and silver, 
And if that's what he gives to me, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do more or less. If that's my attitude, not to, I'll understand it. But if it isn't, then I'm going to come away scratching my head. Well, hey, you know, I don't know what it means. Now, one reason people don't understand the Bible is they're refusing to accept it as the sole standard of authority. Others just simply are prejudiced. They close their ears and they cover their eyes with preconceived ideas and opinions. Now, this is why I've always been taught. This is why I've always believed. I've gone to church since I was about five years old, and I'll tell you what, in my church, in the church that my parents raised me in, this is what we were taught. This is what I always believed. And then when they come face to face with something that's contrary to that, well, I see that, but this is what I've always believed. And this is what I've always been taught. And I've felt this way all of my life. Well, you see, when we, when we base our faith upon a preconception, no matter how long we've had it, it's going to blind us to the truth that we're reading. Isn't, isn't that kind of attitude the same attitude that almost cost Naaman his life in 2 Kings chapter 5 when this, this Syrian general was stricken with leprosy and he goes to Elisha the prophet and the, Elisha the prophet says, you know what, you can be healed, but here's what you do. Go down to the Jordan River and dip seven times and you'll be you'll be your, your leprosy will be gone. You'll be healed. Now Naaman's response was, you know, I, you know, I said to myself that that's not what the prophet's going to say to me. He's going to come out. And he's going to wave his hands around. He's going to call upon God and he's going to make a big display. And so I'm not going to do it because that's contrary to the opinion that I had. And it almost cost him his life until. Young Baden kind of said, well, wait a minute here. Well, why not do it? If that's what God said, why not do it? Isn't that the attitude that caused Saul of Tarsus to persecute Christians? Acts 26 and verse 9, I, I, I thought within myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. You see, these preconceived ideas will often blind us to what it is that God is saying. You know, I, I got to tell you, it, it's, it's prejudice that causes people to misunderstand clear little passages of Scripture. You, you take you, you take the passage in Acts two and verse thirty-eight. We're all familiar with that. Peter said, "Repent and let every one, or let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit." I'm telling you, that is a sentence that's not only by grammarians, easy to outline and easy to diagram. It is by just simple people like me, easy to be understood. Unless I have a preconception. Unless there's something that will forbid me or prevent me from understanding it. It's preconceived ideas who say, hey, I, don't, I don't see that. Really? Let me give you another illustration of that. You take the passage in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6 that says to churches, withdraw yourselves from every brother who walks disorderly. And when a church is about to do that, you know you've always got somebody who jumps up and screams, I've never heard of this being done before in my life. So what? If that's what God says, it's there, it is a command. You know? But is preconceived ideas keeping me from understanding that? I'll give you another. First Corinthians chapter five and verse eleven, speaking of those who have been withdrawn from, those who have been disciplined by a local church, with such a one know not to eat. You know, it's preconceived ideas that keep us from understanding that and keep us from respecting that. And suddenly, those verses become ambiguous and hard to be understood. Really. The problem is that we're trying to read the Bible through these preconceived tinted glasses that we have and we come away misunderstanding. It's prejudice. It causes people to say what was said to Sue and I when we were struggling to learn the truth and we were talking about maybe visiting a local church of Christ. 
It's prejudice that says you want to stay away from those people. You don't want to have anything to do with those people. That's prejudice speaking. It's prejudice that misunderstands Ephesians 5 and verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know, that's easy to be understood as well. But yet prejudice sets in. Preconceived ideas step in and we suddenly have a hard time understanding what that verse is teaching us. I, I think it, it, this idea is best illustrated by something Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, when he's talking to the Corinthians about the problem that the Jews had in understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. And he's talking about first century Jewish people. And he says, you know what? Here's the problem. Verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 3. He said, their minds were blinded. For until this day, the, re the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Now what he's talking about here is when you read in the Old Testament about the Messiah, what the Messiah would become and be, he said the reason these Jewish people are not understanding it is not because the Bible is shrouded in mystery. It's a mystery that's been revealed. What he says is that there's a veil over these people's minds, and that's a preconceived idea. It's a veil that keeps from understanding. He said in verse 16, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Are you willing to accept the Bible as the standard? If you are, then that veil of prejudice will be removed. And he goes on and down verse 3 of chapter 4, and he says, But even if our gospel is veiled, he said it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. You see, prejudice preconceived ideas and opinions have the power to blind us to the truth of what God has revealed. A prejudiced mind is a closed mind. A prejudiced heart is a closed heart unwilling to accept the truth. Now notice what's said. In, Hebrew, I mean in Luke chapter 8 verse 11 as Jesus begins to explain the parable of the story, He said, now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Remember, a closed mind is a hardened heart. A veiled mind is a hardened heart. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the Word out of their hearts lest they should believe and be saved. So you see, we need to be careful how we hear and not hear with a prejudiced mind or a preconceived mind. But there's another reason that people have a hard time understanding the Bible. And that's because they're just unwilling to make difficult applications. Oh, oh, I don't know if I can do that. I, I don't know if that's possible. You, you think with me for a moment in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29. This, this one comes to Jesus and wants to know what to do to have eternal life. Jesus, well, here, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. First off, you need to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. And he said, oh yeah, there's something else that you need to do too. You need to love your neighbor as yourself. But now if you read on and down verse 29, you find that the one who asked Jesus said, you know, he said, well, I'll tell you what, he's willing to justify himself. And he said, you know, that's a pretty... Who is my neighbor? Not just who is my neighbor. You see, that would have been a very difficult application for a Jew to make. Especially those who had bigotry in their hearts toward the Gentiles and toward the Samaritans. Uh-uh... I you know oh, you got to we got to go beyond this. Well, hey, now you tell me to love my neighbor, then you identify who my neighbor is, and I'll love him. But I know my neighbor's not a Gentile. I know my neighbor's not a Samaritan. You tell me who is my neighbor. You see, that was a very difficult application. Is it hard to understand who our neighbors are? No, but when it comes to making that application, it becomes very difficult. 
And if we're like the man of the parable, we seek to justify ourselves. I tell you what, we may come away scratching. Well, I just, I'm not real sure I know who my neighbor is. You know, you know I, I think Jesus addresses a similar issue as this back in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus said to the people that was listening to Him, you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Yeah, I got you on that one, Lord. I can do that. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, I can hate my I, I can hate my enemy about as hard as anybody can hate anybody. And Jesus said, "Well, no, well, hold on. Then. It, it, pay attention to this. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you." Now I'm telling you, that's when the rubber hits the road. That's hard to apply. Now, I'm not willing to do that. I, I don't understand that. That's a little bit cloudy to me. I don't think that's what the Lord... Ha really? I mean, that's what He says. Well, you know, that's hard to apply. Now, when we make our understanding of the Bible predicated upon that which is easy to apply, then we're certainly going to misunderstand those things that are harder to apply. And there are some hard things to apply, such as Matthew chapter 5, loving your enemy, praying for those who persecute you, doing good to those who despitefully use you. That's hard to do. And that's the reason some people don't understand stand the Bible. They're just, it's hard to make some applications here. James tells us in James 1, verses 23-24, that if you're just going to be a hearer of the Word and not a doer, James says you're kind of like a man that looks at his natural face in a mirror. You know, a guy's going to get up, maybe he's going to go in and see if he needs a shave, and he goes in and looks at himself, or maybe he needs to wash his face and get some of the dirt and spots off of his face, and he goes in and looks in the mirror, but he doesn't make any changes. He just goes away, and, and he still needs to shave, and he still has the dirt all over his face. He looked, but he didn't do. He didn't make a change. And that's the way that several people hear the Word. And I know. You know, I, I have people tell me sometimes after preaching a lesson dealing with perhaps relationships, dealing with things that need to be done in one's life, and I'll have people tell me, you know, J.R., you stepped all over my toes today. Well, what, what are you going to do about it? Evidently, you're telling me that here is something that needs to be applied in your life. Are there changes occurring now in your life? Or you just go home and change shoes? You know, what's going on here? Am I just a hearer rather than a doer? Am I making applications? Am I making changes? You, 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 you take, for example, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Or verses 9 and 10 rather, where Paul is talking about the, the apparel, the dress that Christian women are to wear, modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety as women professing godliness. You know, we talk about that in the abstract. Do we make application when it comes to our daughters and what they're wearing? Do we allow them to go to the, to the swimming pool wearing, you know, modern bathing suits? Do we make that application? Or do I somehow I know what's modest, what's short? How tight, how tight is too tight? How low is too low? Do we some sort of equivocate on that? Is it hard to understand? Or is it hard to make the application? Matthew 19 and verse 9 teaches us, and you take it within the context of that verse 3, that there's one cause and one cause only for divorce, and that's for the cause of, uh, of adultery or fornication that a man or a woman has to put away his or her spouse because of the sin of adultery. And if you marry another who's been divorced in that without that being the case, then you're committing adultery. Is that hard to understand? No. But I'll tell you what it is. It is hard to apply. When it applies to ourself or to a future spouse or to a child or to a friend, then we begin to rethink. We begin to rethink now the passage, rather than being clear, is ambiguous. No, it's just difficult to apply. That's the problem. 
Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. There's nothing difficult about that verse, but I'll tell you what. When I began to contemplate my sainted grandmother who died and never was baptized, or I think about a dear brother or sister who passed away years ago, never heard the truth, never was baptized, and suddenly that passage becomes very difficult to understand. No, it's just difficult to apply. And that keeps us from understanding the Scriptures. You see, if we aren't willing to make difficult applications, we'll never understand it. It reminds me of John chapter 10 when the Jews came to Jesus in verse 24. They said, well, I'll tell you what, now, if, you're, if you're the Christ, you tell us plainly. And Jesus said, you know what? I have told you, and you have not believed. I've made it as plain as I could. The problem is they were not willing to accept this Galilean carpenter as the promised Messiah. That was the problem. But there's another reason. Let me hurriedly get to it. The people don't understand the Bible, not just because they're unwilling to accept it as a sole standard of authority, and not just because they're prejudiced, and not just because they are unwilling to make difficult applications, but there are some who have absolutely become dull, dull of hearing. This is something that Jesus warned about in the sermon on, uh, in, in the parable of the sower, Matthew 13 and verse 15. He's quoting from the book of Isaiah. There's some who, you know, their, their hearts have grown dull. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews 5 and verse 11 speaks of those who have become dull of hearing. Dull is the opposite of sharp. You know, if we think about knives or scissors that become dull, we understand that they're pretty well useless. But now if they're able to be sharpened, then they're able to be used again. And think of, think of it in that way. Jesus said there are those who are dull of hearing. And that's what the Hebrew writer is talking about. Now in the fifth chapter of Hebrews, when he talks about those who are dull of hearing, if you look within the context of that, you find out why they have grown dull of hearing. You know, it's just like scissors or knives that grow dull. It's, we just throw them in a drawer and don't use them. They get knocked around. They're rusty or whatever, and they become dull. They become useless. Well, we either have to sharpen them, or, <laughs> you know, we have, to, we, we, have, we have to keep them ready to be able to, to be used. They have to be used and sharpened, and uh, if they're neglected, then they're not going to be of any use. Well, in Hebrews chapter 5, he said in verse 14, after pointing out that some are dull of hearing, he said, you ought to be teachers by now. But here's what the problem is. He said, there are those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The problem is, I become dull of hearing when I don't exercise my senses. When I'm not ready to receive that word. If I don't, you know, if I don't use that word, if I don't put it into practice, then I'm not going to understand it and my faith is going to grow stagnant. It's like Jesus said, if you have, it'll be taken from you if you don't use it. It's, you know, it's the old idea, you know, use it or lose it. That's the way it is with our ability to hear the word. Use it or lose it. Have you become dull of hearing. Answer it like this. Do you enjoy reading the Bible? Is the Bible a dull read for you? And answer it like this. You know, does Bible study that we have here, is it something that is depressing to you? And what about, you know, what about sermons? Are, are sermons tiresome to you? Are you dull of hearing? Yeah, and that's a problem that some people have. And if people who have grown dull of hearing do not understand, they will not receive, and they will not obey. And the solution lies with you. You can do something about it. So we close by asking you this question. How do you hear Scripture? Do you hear Scripture with the receptacles to receive that? Are you an eager listener to Scripture? Do you have the capacity to understand? Are you willing to accept it as the bottom line, as the standard of authority in all that you say and do? 
Are you willing to remove any preconceived ideas? And I'm going to tell you something. Preconceived ideas are not something that's only found in denominational churches. Sometimes it's found among the people of God. Are we willing to lay aside preconceived ideas and opinions? Are we willing to make the difficult applications? Or have we grown dull of hearing? You see, the Bible is intended to be understood and to be applied. It's as simple as that. So how do you hear? When the Bible says to you, he who believes and is baptized will be saved and he who believes not will be condemned, how do you receive that? You make an application? The Bible says, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3. How do you receive that? Are you really actually changing? The Bible says that we're to confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the day of Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. How do we receive that? You know, it's up to us. We can make a change if we have receptacles. You're subject to the invitation. Why don't you come right now? Together we stand. Let's receive. Well,